folks. Welcome to episode 40 of North American Deer Talk. Want to go ahead and take care of our housekeeping today and talk to you about our sponsor of the show, Servit Solutions. Servit Solutions is a health management system that I manage and operate here in north central Pennsylvania. It is uh, based around really two primary tenants. Number one is the use of uh, custom-made vaccines, which we do sell uh, for deer and elk producers and pen density. I've talked about this at nauseum, but it is important and uh, we're grateful for the opportunity to be able to share those things with you on a regular basis. Make sure you connect with us at our various social media platforms, North American Deer Talk, Servit Solutions on Facebook, Instagram, etc. If you're watching this live on YouTube, please like, subscribe, etc. If you know someone that you would find uh, this valuable, for just share it out with them we appreciate it uh, we want to continue to uh, build on the work that we've done before and grow our community in today's episode you are going to um, be able to listen to gary cook from nadr that's the north american deer registry and we're going to follow up on the interview that i did with dr chris seabury uh, just a few short weeks ago and and kind of uh, hopefully uh, get everybody prepared for uh, the test that is going to be available for them. I hope you enjoy the show and we will talk to you soon. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is your host, Josh Newton, for another episode of North American Deer Talk. We have a special guest today, Gary Cook from Nadar. How are you, Gary? I'm good. Thank you. Welcome to the show. Appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with us today. I look forward to the conversation. Um, so one of the, um, the reasons that I wanted to get you on is I had the opportunity to interview Dr. Chris Seabury, I guess it would have been uh, two or three weeks ago, and, yep. and discuss with him about uh, his research that he's been working on and, and kind of how it has evolved into, you know, commercial commercial entity. And right. of course, Nadar plays a, a, a big role in that. So that really prompted my, my um, wanting to, to speak with you. But I guess first, before we get into some of those things, um, why don't you just introduce yourself to people and, uh, you know, kind of talk about your, your role at NADAR, et cetera. Sure. Yeah, so I'm Gary Cook, and I'm the executive director, and I've been with NADAR this second time um, since about 2014. So I originally was, was um, with a scientific genetic testing company previously, and we helped found this this uh, actual registry. And so back in 2007, we actually started the registry and I was CFO for a genetics testing company at that time. Um, since that time I had left that company. And um, so in about 2014, the board asked me if I would come back and resume that position. And so I did since 2014. Um, so my job primarily is to ensure that the clients are taken care of, that we negotiate effectively with the lab and that things are being actually turned around on time. And so um, we have a staff of probably seven or eight, only two are full time, the rest are part time, uh, depending on the season. As you know, it can be busier in the summer than it is in the fall or the, I guess the winter. So, but yeah, so I, I, I've been around this business, I guess, in theory since 2007. Right. Um, so, and just for, for folks listening, uh, we say NADAR, if you're not familiar with that, uh, N-A-D-R, that's the North American yes. Deer Registry. So I right, just wanted, to, wanted to clear that up. We, we talk about it, but correct. if you're, correct. uh, if you're not familiar with it, that's what it is. And, and um, also just to, just to clarify, Josh, the reason we gave it that name originally was the founding board members who were, I mean, all over the country, you know, we had board members in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Oklahoma, Texas, um, Iowa, and the reason they picked that name was because we wanted to include all deer eventually. And so our goal is, is if there's a need for other cervid, like fallow deer or red deer or mule deer, which we already have, then we want to be actually inclusive of, of, of that that of breed. So, yeah, it makes perfect sense. I, uh, yeah. I, you know, so I'm a I'm a white tail guy, yeah. and at this point in time, you know, there's a, a large segment of the industry that's that's whitetail and and you know we don't want to don't want to necessarily get inside our own little our own little bubbles and forget that there there's a vibrant uh, yeah. community of elk farmers and mule deer farmers and 
and red deer farmers and those businesses continue to expand and we we face a lot of the same challenges so that's, right. that's really great to hear um can you just kind of give us a, a a little bit more overview of of what nadar actually does and kind of the the working components of it so i mean it was founded in 2007 i guess um you know to make sure that that we provided a service for parentage basically right and you know, back before 2007, it was just a handshake and, you know, just trust me, right? Um, and I, I don't think that that there's people out there that would on purpose try to deceive anybody, but with all with, with all the line reading that happens with what we do, it could be easily get mixed up, right? And so we felt like that we had to provide a service that would give people peace of mind that that deer is that deer, right? Um, and so, as you probably know, back in 2007, it wasn't even a requirement to be in an auction, but now you have to have DNA to be in that auction. So that was the main reason we did it, is to provide people peace of mind. Um, so the, and, and, and I guess we should say it out front, like, this is a DNA service, right? Like, yes, the yeah, genetic world. testing service. Yeah, there you go. And, yeah. and we're not limited to just look at parentage though right. right now that's our that's our main right been our main focus correct um so give, give us a taste of what the what the registry looks like in its current form like what how do we interact with that what does that look like kind of high level picture you mean as far as the day-to-day -day stuff with the staff or well just the the registry itself the way let's say a producer would interact with it like what what are yeah. kind of what does that look like for me so it all depends, and I, I guess my management style, and, and I think I've told the board this, is that I want to make everybody feel comfortable if we can, but also I want to make things as simple as possible, even though sometimes it's hard to make DNA genetic testing simple. Um, and so our goal, again, is to provide that service, and the breeder, if, if it's a brand new breeder, then what we do is, is we'll, we'll reach out to them and talk to them and tell them what to do from A to Z, and it's pretty simple. To, to be in the registry, all you have to do is be a member of TDA or Nadifa or VDM, right? Venados de Mexico. Um, and if you're a member of them, you have to submit one deer at least to be a member of the registry because everybody wants to be in the registry because they want to have access to the online inventory, right? So they can see all these deer out there. Um, but again, it, it's, it's a piece of paper that they can fill out either manually if they choose to, because we have some customers that don't use computers, which we understand. Um, and so if they want to do it manually, they can, or they can go online and do an Excel spreadsheet, or they can use a service called GMS, and they can do it all via that service. And then, so basically all they do is populate the animal's information, you know, basic stuff, year born, age, um, and then they submit it to us, and then they tell us, we want you to compare to these animals, right? This, this, this sire, this dam. And um, so our goal is then to take that information, plug it into our system, submit a sample, which we'll talk about in a minute, sample type, submit that sample to the laboratory. And then the laboratory does their magic and then it gets sent back to us. And then we analyze it and determine, does that sire and dam match up? Or is there multiple sire and dams that match up? Um, Sounds simple, right? Um, but behind the scenes, which we'll talk about too, I'm assuming is the technology's changed a lot from what they call STR technology, which is microsatellite, or now to SNPs, which I'm assuming Dr. Seabury told you what that stood for, um, but we'll just call it SNP, right? So it's a more robust technology. So we, we changed that technology because of the tight breeding that we have now, it has made it really difficult to compare animals. And if we didn't switch, and so the board had the forethought enough four or five years ago, if we don't switch technologies, we won't be able to help them. We can't tell them who their animals are. And so switching technologies is one thing we've done to try to make it easier on the breeder. So we'll, we'll talk about that too, I assume in a minute, but uh, the goal is to get them a result. It's either yes or no, right? Yes, it belongs to the animal or not. And if it doesn't, we will communicate with them and call them and say, well, this doesn't match up. Can, can it maybe be somebody else? And so we kind of spend time with them. I mean, I've known our scientists could spend hours with a breeder at one time going through his or her animals. And the goal is to make them satisfied. Now, there's times they don't like the answer they get, right? But 
it is what it is. And we try our best to accommodate them, even go as far as rerun that sample again, just to make sure it is what it is. So again, the goal is to get a piece of paper at the end that says, here's your animal, here's the mom and the dad, right? And the goal is to fill in that lineage to make it look like that animal has been around for a while. And so our goal is to complete those. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a very fluid process, but behind the scenes, it's, it's a process that, you know, takes a lot of time and effort and it's not simple for everyone. It's not just a point, click and chip. Yes, it is your animal or no, it's not your animal. 80% of them, it's like that, but the other 20%, we have to do some legwork and, you know, help them find that animal. So the, uh, the registry itself, um, you had mentioned the online uh, registry where all the, the data was, was entered in and, and people could interact with that. Um, that is a, a, a house, if you will, or a bank of all the uh, lineage of all the animals right. that have ever been tested. What kind right. of numbers do you have in there? How many? How many? Is it's the, over three hundred. I, I, I probably three and a quarter, three twenty-five, three hundred twenty-five thousand animals. Um, and you know, it, it's a valuable piece of information. It's it's valuable data, right? And I think for breeders who are starting today, they have an advantage over those guys that started in two thousand seven, right? So now they can pour through those genetics and decide how they're going to do things versus the guys that started 15 years ago had to just figure it out themselves. And so it does provide a service. And our board also pushed us to be more technical savvy and to make it more appealing. And so a couple of years ago, we, we changed the online inventory to make it somewhat adaptable for mobile, right? So people could use it on their phones at an auction. So today it's a little bit more appealing to the younger generation, right? Um, and it works fairly well. Um, but again, it, it's something that they can use in an auction, they can use at home, they can use wherever, or they can call their friend and say, check out my animal online, right? I see I see more and more um, within some of the uh, whitetail deer Facebook groups, you know, screenshots from the, yeah, from the exactly. registry. And they're obviously yeah. coming from a from a phone and people are, you know, sit and check out this this phone that was yeah. just born. And pretty neat to to be able to uh, to see that kind of interactiveness right. with the the system. So that's great. Um, Okay, so I, I guess let's um, let's start at, at the beginning and let's say um, what samples do you take and, and what do I get to you to, to get this process going? Okay, repeat that question again. I want to make sure I understood you. So when I when I am collecting genetic material from my animals, what am I collecting and, and what am I sending to you? What do you guys accept? How does that work? So, of course, that's also changed over time, but you know, I, I guess originally most people used hair, right? So they, they picked the, they pulled the hair from the tail, you know, and the, if it's a fawn, it's a little bit different, right? Because they're really fine hairs versus if it's an older animal, it's more coarse. But so um, we, we like for them to, to pull enough that we can do a sample on it, right? So hair's, hair's acceptable, tissue's acceptable, acceptable, blood's acceptable. But what we're trying to do now is encourage people to use actual tissue tubes made by a company called Allflex. And the reason we encourage those is because our lab has a machine that they can just plug those in and it's, it's much more effective. So long term, I think it'll be quicker. I think we'll have less data issues. And I think that we can actually run those samples multiple times without having to ask for more samples. Because like right now, if you run a hair sample, you may use it all in one test. And if we have to rerun that sample, we may not have enough. And as you know, you can't just go back and grab hair from a deer whenever you feel like it, right? So you may have to say, I'm waiting till next fall. And so it's frustrating for people, I get it. Um, so, so we have them ship their, their sample, be it hair, to blood, which blood's hardly ever used, by the way. We don't encourage blood. Um, and then last case, antler core. So some of these guys have older animals, they, they never got a sample and they have to get an antler core. We have specific instructions on our website, and I won't go into those details on how to do all those samples, especially antler core, because it's very sensitive to where you get the actual antler core, yep. if it'll work, right? And even then, it may be 75% of the time it works. So if it's sitting out in a field in, in the hot sun for three years, the DNA may not work, right? So it's, it's really luck. And also, we do semen straws as well. So hair, antler, blood, tissue, 
Siemens straws. We, we do all those and we have detailed instructions on our website how to get all that information to us. Yeah, I'll link, I'll link that up in the, uh, in the show notes with the, okay. the, uh, the website there and, and uh, that'll be helpful for guys if they wanna, wanna check those, those more detailed instructions out. You mentioned uh, Siemens straws. Um, is that something that you can, you can use? Obviously you can use it fresh because there's material there, but um, how about ones that you've already used? Yeah, for sure. We can get DNA from those. And then also from the cotton, right? We can do that. But again, I'll let David or Dr. Seabury speak about the technical from those. Um, but, and also semen straws can be expensive, right? So you don't want to ship one to a lab and then God, that, I mean, I can make four grand off that, that <laughs> straw. You're, you're, you know. So we try to use as little as possible or just use the cotton tip or whatever. So we're not taking all the semen, of course. So, um, but I don't think we get a lot of those. I think it's in rare situations where they just can't get a sample that they need it. Gotcha. Um, and then you had mentioned the the tubes, and I want to I want to touch on that a little more yeah. because um, that's that's something that's um, it's not necessarily new, but it's kind of newer to our industry. And right. and the the level of automation on the the labs end to work through the processing. Um, with these tubes, I think is is worth noting. Um, can you just touch on that a little more about the importance of of wanting to use the tubes and and yeah. there's actually a financial incentive to to doing so. Yeah. So we we as a board and as a as a service said, if you'll use those tubes, you go out and buy them. I think it's two dollars plus you pay for shipping, so cost you two and a quarter, a little bit less. We will reimburse you three dollars for that. So that way you're not out any money. And I know some people wanted us to hold them in inventory. And I'm like, guys, I don't want to be in the inventory business because <laughs> that is expensive. And so you buy them, you use them fine. If you don't use them fine, but if you submit them, we'll give you a credit. So it doesn't cost you a dime. Um, one, they're easier to handle, right? Um, because they're all barcoded. And so that barcode can be linked up not only to NADAR, but to our laboratory. And it's just boom, boom, scan, scan, right? Instead of having to type in information. Secondly, it's easier than hair because they just take that tube, they put it into a system. That system, that robot punches a hole in the top of it and does its magic, right? Takes the DNA out. It's not that easy, but it, it, it is kind of. Mm -hmm. Versus hair, they have to take the hair, put it out on a table, punch it, put it on a card. And then after each time they do that, then they have to take their tools, clean them off, put alcohol on them, whatever. And then, you know, their desk is all cleaned off again, you know, right? So that takes a lot longer and you get hair everywhere, especially in the winter time, you know, um, so hair goes flying everywhere. You could, I guess, contaminate the sample. And so hair is messy and it takes longer. And so we're trying to encourage people to use these tubes. Um, I, I get it. Some people will never not use hair. And if that's what they want to do, we will not make them use tubes, but I just encourage them. One, there's a financial incentive, like you said, and secondly, it's easier for the laboratory. And long term, uh, it will allow us to maybe retest those animals again if we have to in the future. Yeah, I think that's important because there's, if you if you look at you know when you do a hair collection, you know it's, yeah. it's, they're asking for for thirty hair with follicles, and if you've ever yanked some hair out of a deer, all the little fat follicles or the skin particulates yeah. are are hooked on the end. Um, if you look at that in comparison to physical size of the ear punch, there's a lot of material there. Yep. Um, and, and you're exactly right. I think there are situations um, where a sample may need to be run again. And, and you had mentioned before, not, you know, it's not easy to get hair from a deer. So yep. um, that's. Uh, and, and also, Josh, I think that, as you said, it, it's an ear punch, right? So you can kill two birds with one stone. You can put the ear tag in and get a sample at the same time. In fact, on our website, we uh, interviewed one of our board members, Michael Devaney, who actually did a video for us with Keith Warren, and you may want to link to that too. And he basically shows how easy it is to do that for a deer. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I certainly will. And I know uh, just on some of our, our kind of uh, impromptu platforms, I've showed the AllFlex Tagger and the TSU tubes yeah. a dozen times because they're just, they're really handy. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have our, our samples in the lab. Um, talk us through... Uh, just on a very high level, the SNPs uh, technology, if you will, and then, yeah. you know, where, where we go from there. 
So SNPs has been around for a lot longer than, than people know. And the reason the people in the deer business don't know, because we've never presented it to them, right? Now, some people in the deer business also have other animals, cattle, you know, swine, um, cattle, whether it be beef cattle or dairy cattle, they've been using SNPs for years. And of course, Dr. Seabury can talk about this ad nauseum because he, he actually has gotten grants over this, but the, the actual cattle industry makes certain breeding decisions off of SNPs. So they know like feed out ratio, they know certain things that, that we don't know right now. But I mean, all these years they've been working on this to make their animal production more efficient so they can make decisions quickly. So SNPs has been around for that for years. With, without talking science, because I'm not a scientist by the way, um, SNPs and STRs, it's like um, a horse and a Maserati, right? So a horse will get you there, but it may take longer. Um, you, you know, you, you can't you can't go over certain terrains or whatever, but it's just at some point in time, you need to get there quicker, right? And, and also um, with all the breeding with STRs, it was 18 markers plus a parentage marker. I mean, if it was a male or female, sorry. And then SNPs is 400 and plus, and we, we could add more if we wanted to. So the ability to discriminate and to diversify genetics by having more markers, it works, right? And so we had to get from STRs to SNPs. Otherwise, we would never be able to tell which animal belonged to which animal. And I can tell you, and David can talk about this, and he gets excited about this, that He'll run right now. We run STRs and SNPs on on the animals that haven't been SNPed before, and the reason we do is because we can't compare back lineage with SNPs. It's like apples and oranges, right? So we have to run STRs on that animal and SNPs. We compare to the old animals with the STRs, and then forward we compare with SNPs. Well, what we're finding out with the SNPs, David goes, Gary, it's like night and day how easy it is with SNPs. We know for sure that that animal belongs with that animal. And we've had cases where we've we, we've had an animal, the breeder said it belongs to this animal with STRs it matched. And then SNPs came rolling in about a day later and we're like, it's not the right animal. Absolutely can't be that animal. And we've, we've had to change it, right? And so, that's why SNPs are so important because it allows us to look deeper into that animal because we have more markers. That's great. Um, as, as the database, excuse me, as the uh, population gets kind of converted away from STR and we get more and more SNPs in the, in the, in the database, in the system, right. um, do, you, do you anticipate a time frame when STR goes away from, from where you're at? Are you working towards that? We so, are, it's a good a question. Well, the goal is this year, December, 2021. That's what we voted on our board meeting. And, you know, I, I kind of believe you get more with carrots than you do with sticks, right? And so, you know, some people are like, what snips? I never heard of. I'm like, guys, we've been doing this for five years and you haven't heard of it. Um, officially, any animal tested after 2017 has SNPs on it. So behind the scenes, we were running SNPs. And so if, if you don't plan to breed with your animal, there's no need to run SNPs because we're not going to compare to it, right? So save your time, save your money, don't, don't use SNPs, right? Um, but we need those STRs to compare to back lineage. Now, I'm assuming David and, and Dr. Seabury can figure out a way to mathematically figure it out, right? So if we had to, we could. Um, so we are basically forcing people by submitting their animals, they're automatically gonna convert. Um, I don't know what's gonna happen at the end of this year. That is our deadline. Um, personally, um, I, I think there will be breeders that need to test after that and we'll have to run STRs and you know whether or not we charge more for it or, you know, Again, I, I don't know because I don't want to discourage people sending samples to the, you know, to us. And so I, I don't want to do away with it if there's still a good bunch of people that haven't converted yet. Um, I do think that this new CWD test, which we'll talk about, will get a lot of people excited and they will submit animals they've never submitted before. And by running that CWD test, which I'm assuming we'll talk about too, they will automatically 
be SNP converted because we have SNPs on that CWD panel. So I think that's going to encourage and speed up the process. Yep. And I was, I was just getting ready to segue and you, you, uh, you okay. did it nicely for me. So thank you. Um, so I want to, I want to get into the, the offerings of this, this new CWD test. And there's a couple um, different things that I want to get into with it. If I use some of the wrong terminology, please correct me because I want to make sure, sure that our vernacular is all, all very clear for everyone. So we, we know what we're talking about. Um, so we've, we've established the basis of the registry and we, I, I do anyway, I understand how the, the DNA process works. We now have uh, a technology available to us. Um, we've mentioned Dr. Seabury uh, quite a few times already on the podcast. And um, this, this new GPS CWD test is an analysis, a genomic analysis of uh, animals based on the DNA that they submit to, to NADAR. Um, and it's going to give them some sort of uh, evaluation, a breeding evaluation yeah. of those. Yeah. That's the overview. Um, walk us, walk us through, I guess, kind of the, the process of, of how we got here. And then we'll, we'll kind of, we'll talk about the future a little bit. Yeah. You mean how we got to, to the test that we're getting ready to start running? Yes. Um, well, I mean, as you know, I guess the, the deer industry is in flux when it comes to this disease, right? It's really crippled a lot of farms. And, um, you know, so there's been a lot of money thrown around to research um, this, both through NADAR and through other organizations, whether it be APHIS or whatever. Um, and so people want to find out. Now, right now, there's no test to tell you if you have it or not, right? I, do I think there'll, there'll be one in the next five years? Probably, but we can't wait for that. So this new test that we came up with, because at first, if you remember, we, we had what they call a PRNP genes, and that was what Dr. Seabury talked about, and um, they had five markers that we were looking at, right, and right now, we run that test for breeders, and, and it gives them those five markers for their deer, and then that they make decisions based on those markers. While I don't agree with that, and I, I make that clear, on what we send them. They should not be using any one of these genes individually to make, make certain decisions as far as breeding, but it does kind of give them an insight to patterns, right? And so even though Dr. Seabury knew that those genes do provide some data and some value, i.e. the PRMP gene 96, right? It's, it's, it's not testing the whole genome. And again, I'm not a scientist. So Dr. Seabury said, I want to gather data from the whole deer genome. I want to get you know, information from each chromosome, right? And that will give us a better picture. And so, as he described to you in your podcast, he did just that. And so now we have a 50K chip that has tens of thousands of markers that will give us what we call a susceptibility number, right? I'm not ready to get into details about that yet, maybe in a couple of weeks, because I, I hope in a couple of weeks, maybe maybe if you can interview, you know, David Ultashilti, our senior scientist, we can actually show you the report online and show you what it's going to look like, right? But in, in summary, it's going to be a report that says, okay, here's your deer, the age born, ear tag, all that information. Um, it, it'll show probably sire and dam, and then it'll also show a number, susceptibility, and it'll be... And again, I, I can't quote this, Seabury's like, we're not talking numbers, but you know, it'll be like 0.4 to negative 0.4, right? It'll have a range. And the, the more negative it is, the better it is. You're least susceptible to have CWD. Does that mean you won't ever have it? No, it just means you're least susceptible. So, so what we'll have also on that report, besides where you stand, let's say you're a negative 0.25, we'll have the range of every deer that we've tested thus far it'll have a range that goes from x to x and so now we're talking to dr seabury to david i'll probably talk to some of my board members about what do deer breeders need the most to make this decision because it's not going to be a pregnancy test it's not going to be you are or you're not it's going to have a number and so now these breeders need to know well what do i do with that number right okay i'm a negative 0.25 does that mean i keep them or not or well, I'm a positive two. Does that mean I keep it or not? Do I breed with it or not? And so what we're working on now is to, to provide some type of insight to what that negative 0.25 means in, in relation to the industry as a whole. And then the breeder will have to make that decision for him or herself, right? 
Um, I know Dr. Seabury will probably make himself available to discuss with breeders if they so choose. But of course, you know, he can't talk to 600 breeders. And so the goal is to come up with a link, if, if you will, or some type of white paper that'll kind of walk through with everybody. Here's what this means. Here's where we are today. And here's probably what you should do if, if you come up with these values, correct? Um, and I think you went into it in your podcast too, that if you breed two negatives, you're probably gonna get a negative susceptibility deer, right? Um, and so I think some of these breeders, it's gonna be trial and error. It's gonna be, I'm gonna take my animal that scores this and I'm gonna try to breed with them or the animals that scored positive, I'm not gonna breed with them and try to see what happens, right? Some people may have to introduce new genetics to get what they want, correct? Sure. Um, sure. But again, you know, we'll, we'll give them a number and then that number is gonna give them an insight to what they need to do with, with their animals. So, and, and I mean, I wish, wish I could tell you more, but I just, I can't tell you what the report's gonna look like here for about the next two weeks, I'll know. Sure. Um, um, so I submit a TSU to, to you and I have some options there's there's a there's a menu right yeah. of of what I can get done so give me the full spectrum I want I want to do everything tell me what those are and then we'll fill in some uh, some prices on the test just to give people a an so idea. you hate when somebody asks you a question and they say it depends right so yeah. <laughs> it depends um, you know, one one thing I've learned by by doing this CWD test, I, I said, send me our form that we use now. And I looked at it and I'm like, God, there's so much information on here. Um, and I always tell our 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 staff, we're we're always open to making things better and easier and more efficient. So we're always open to constructive comments from people if it is easy. Because when I look at it, I'm like, there's a lot of data on here. Um, so first of all. Today, you have the option to do parentage if you choose. And that parentage can be done. Um, you can manually submit your samples or you can do it through Excel or GMS, right? So that's your two choices for that. And the price is different for those two. Um, you can just do the, the prion genes. That's a separate test right now, but you could choose. It's those five, those, those five genes. Um, and or you can do a ID match, which basically an ID match, as you know, is you want to know, I have this animal, I bought it at an auction. I wanna know, does it really belong to that animal? Does it match? And so we do that for customers too. So, so that would be an option. Next is when we do parentage, you know, we're always doing comparisons and it may not work out. And so they may come back and say, okay, now I want you to compare this, this animal to these animals. And then that would create what we call a work order. And that work order is basically, we're now taking the data and we're going into the database and doing research to see if we can find your answer. And it's a small fee for that as well, which, which we don't do a lot of that. We try to incorporate everything in their original request so we don't have to charge them anymore for it. Gotcha. Um, so, with, so, I mean, that's what we do today. With the new CWD test, that's gonna, you'll get parentage, you'll get the new, CWD susceptibility assay, and that includes the prion gene test as well. And I think when people hear how much it's gonna cost, they're gonna be like, well, that's pretty dang good. I mean, considering it's the same price as we're doing parentage for today, pretty much. That's awesome. Yeah, for, all, for all three of those. So I, yeah. get, I get parentage, I get the PN, PRNP uh, test, and yeah. I get the new GPS yeah. CWD susceptibility yeah. test. Yeah. For the same price as parentage today. Yeah. So everybody's going to do the CWE test, I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. You have to. I mean, yeah. I mean, why not? Right. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're converted to SNPs, and, and if you want to talk prices, we can say that. So if, if you're converted to SNPs, your price is $55 today to do parentage. Okay. Uh -huh. if, if you're, if, and, and that's no matter. What? So it's just we're running SNPs, it's $55. If you haven't converted to SNPs and we're running STRs, then the price is going to be um, $65 and for for Excel or GMS. And then if you're doing it manually, it's $70, right? I'm, I'm discussing with myself internally, do I just do away with that and make it one price? Um, but right now it's 65 and 70, depending on if it's manual or Excel. Um, 
So today, if you're submitting a sample and you're running STRs and SNPs, you're paying 70 bucks a sample. And if you want the, the PRMP gene, you're paying $15 on top of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it could cost you $85 to right. do that right now. And you're not getting as much data. Um, with the new CWD test, it's going to be $75, as we said. That includes parentage, CWD, septability, and the prion genes. And that's for SNP only. If, you, if we have to run STRs, it's going to be 92. And the reason we're, we're charging extra for 92 is that's our cost. Basically, we're not going to you know, eat that. We're, we're going to charge extra to cover our cost because the lab has to run two separate tests, right? So 92.75. I mean, I'm a business guy. I'm a finance guy, actually. And so I argued hard for a higher price. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, and I don't want people to think bad. I just said, guys, this, it, it's a great value proposition for our customers. I mean, they're getting a lot of data, but the board really wanted to make this affordable and appealing to all breeders. And I think this price gets there. I think I think it's a great price. I agree. And the the I mean, the fact that that over time, and, and this was talked about a long time ago, um, that over time, that as we developed new technologies, as we incorporated new technologies, as we tested more animals, we were going to get more and more and more for less and less and less. And, yeah. and this just goes to show that that is the fact. Um, so let me let me well, give you a couple. I'm glad of you understand that. I want to say because some people go, well, you said the prices are going down, but we're paying the same as we were 10 years ago. Well, they were paying 75 or 100 10 years ago, but like you said, we're getting more data, so it's not the same thing. You're getting three things now for 75 dollars versus back then you were getting STRs for 75 dollars. So yep. we we are providing more more value to the it, to the breeder. Yeah, it's 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 huge. It's and and you can't really compare the. You couldn't, if you're just looking at it on a one-to-one -one basis, you wouldn't compare the SNPs and the STR at the yeah, same for price, sure. right? Like it's it's a much, much better yeah. um, technology. So- And Josh, I'll tell you, the reason that we were able to do that is because by committing to that chip, it allowed us to drop our price with the lab a little bit so, so we could run all three without having to raise our price. So so that's what, that, that's what we had to do to get that price down. Gotcha. Um, Okay, so I'm going to throw a couple, I guess, examples your way while we're kind of in this testing uh, okay. menu, if you will. Um, I have an animal. It's already been STR and snipped at NADAR, right? I have a buck there. It's done. I want to run the CWD test. I don't have the buck anymore. I don't have any material. What can we do? Well, it's a good question. That's also another price too. I was going to tell you if, if they've previously tested with with Nadar and they have SNPs on file, it'll be fifty dollars to rerun it. Okay, not seventy five. And we have we have to we have to we're not hardly making any money on that, but we have to cover our costs. So fifty dollars to do that. If you have a tissue tube on site and we've ran tissue tubes, we will call the lab. We'll have them pull that tube and run that sample for you and charge you fifty dollars to run that sample. If you don't have a tissue tube with us, then we, we will have to request hair or another tissue tube or semen or whatever, or antler cord. We'll have to have something to rerun that sample. We will not run that sample that's already been submitted unless it has a tissue tube. So we will need a new sample. Okay, so so we'll just say uh, older, older, we'll say, uh, bucks that are already in the registry, but you don't have any material. Today. Well, bucks after 17, bucks after 2017 that have been gotcha. snipped. Okay, yes. gotcha. Um, so let's say that an animal is in the system and it's STR only, and I need to I need to upgrade to the SNP yeah. and do the, the testing. Yeah. Okay, yeah. where are yeah. we at with that one? That's the 70. So, so we're doing that right now, even before the CWD, we're already converting people to SNPs. And what, what we're trying to encourage people, and I'm glad you asked that question, because what, one thing that we did prior to the CWD test is we, we started SNPs. And so we wanted to convert people over. Well, people weren't that happy about doing that because they didn't want to spend more money, right? So what we'll do is if they call the office, we will do a one-for-one -one change. So you send one deer in, or if, if you send two deer in, we'll only charge you for that. Fawn, right? If you say, 
I'm going to send in a bucket of fawn. Well, we'll charge you for one of them. So you, you'll basically buy one, get one free. I hate to use that analogy, yeah, but yeah. so that way it encourages them to do that. And no, we're not, we're not making money. Last year, Nadar spent almost $80,000 of its own money converting animals to SNPs for free. And we do that because we know long term it's, it's the best way to be. And so we continually spend that money, R&D, if you will, to convert people. So if they send an animal, if they send 100 animals in, we'll do 50 of them for free. And, and again, it all depends on what's been converted, what hasn't. I, I haven't seen that many animals submit at the same time, but it's usually 10 and 10 or whatever. But we will work with the breeder to try to make the cost more effective for them to get them converted. Right. So I know, um, and, and I, I want to be cognizant of our time. I, 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 I want to wrap up soon. Um, what, so I know that like guys are collecting material from fawns right now. And, um, you know, we have all these new generations of animals coming as, as they get stuff and we prepare for, for fall, late summer, fall auctions, uh, things like that. There's going to be a lot of material coming into, to NADAR. Um, give us a, a, a timeline of, um, you know, where we're at with, with um, um, you know, getting results back uh, on stuff and then the availability of um, some of the new, new tests and technologies that are coming through. So are you, are you talking about just how long it takes to get stuff back and all that? Yeah. Yep, yep. If I submit something and, and, and you guys get it tomorrow, what, what does that yeah. look like? So normally, d during normal circumstances, we didn't have a new test coming out. It's probably three weeks. And as you know, the summertime is the busy time, you know, for NADAR. The spawns start hitting the ground May, June. And so it, it's it's been this way since the beginning. I actually graph it every year. And it's so funny to show the board. It's the same every year. I mean, even though you may have lower years, the, the peaks and valleys are always the same. So we know... June, July, August are always our busiest months, right? And then we have a pickup in the fall for auctions, right? So you always see that. So we can predict within a couple hundred samples of how many we're going to get that year. We, we, we know that by that month because it happens that same thing every year. The current year has been different. We'll get into that. But during normal years, it's probably three-week turnaround time. And I know um, under the previous lab, things got back a lot quicker um, towards the end and the reason is is because our current lab that we use um, they they do about 20 to 30 thousand samples a day and they're the largest genetic um, testing lab for animals in the world right and they have places all over the world and so they do have a higher throughput that's just it's that simple and no one in the in the world was set up to do snips and so that's why we chose them and so I, I mean, I always tell people that, that you have a three-legged stool. You have price, quality, and the time it takes to get out the door, right? You can't have all three, but you can have two. It's that way in any business. So if you, if you think about your business, you can have price and quality, but it may not be as fast. Or you can have price and fast, but it may not be as good of quality. And so I, I tell people we have to pick. And sometimes it takes longer to get samples out the door because of that. And so but we picked them because their prices were better and their quality was better for sure. Um, but probably three weeks to get out the door and then sometimes two weeks in the off season, like in November, you may get it in 10 days. So it doesn't take as long. Summer times, it could go past three weeks at times. So I always encourage breeders, don't wait till the last minute to send your samples in because it may take a little longer. And it's like, I sent that a week ago. I need it for an auction. And we're like, yeah, sorry. I mean, yeah. if I could get it back for you quicker, I would. I really would. Our lab doesn't do rushes, so we don't put people in front of other people. Because in the past, we would take more money from the breeder and then put them in front. We chose as a board not to do that. I think um, it's not the right thing to do. I think that we people put their animals, they pay the same, and they get in line and we test their animals. And we're not going to put other people in front of people because they pay more money. So. Um, with the new test, I'm telling people it's going to take longer in, in the interim because it is new. And um, so to do suspect some delays. And the reason is, is because today in our office, we're holding 3,000 samples. People are just waiting to do this test, right? And I, I've heard breeders that have never tested with this are going to test. And so there will be a big onslaught of samples coming through. But once that, once that gets through, 
I think we're back to the normal 14 days, 21 days to get samples out the door. Okay, great. Um, the, the so like folks that have samples now that are interested, I, I, I and this is I guess me speculating, but I think people uh, have a lot of genuine interest in the the new um, GPS testing for for CWD. What um, I mean, like I have some samples here sitting on my uh, well, they're not on my desk anymore. They're in the they're in the freezer, but. Um, I, I should get those probably into. That's yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. And then we're, we're what? We're probably looking, you know, four or six weeks, something like that. You figure maybe, that's maybe. Gonna be. But, but again, it, it, it'll be a faster process. It's just what, what we're working out now is the actual logistics, right? Is how we're going to report it, you know, back to the customer. Because now we have two tests that we're going to, well, actually three we're going to give you, right? Parentage the new CWD susceptibility and the prion gene. So now we have three different assays we're gonna give you. I think, I think we're gonna combine the two CWD ones together on one report, then parentage will be separate. So what, what I think is gonna happen is that parentage may come out sooner mm -hmm. and then CWD will come thereafter. That's what I think, but, but who knows what's gonna happen you know, down the road. Does that ultimately get integrated into your online account then? So good question. We, um, we, we, we discussed this. We don't want that to be public information. We don't feel like um, it's very sensitive, as you know. Um, it's almost like it was in 2007 when we started doing DNA testing. People were like, I don't want people to know. And I'm like, well, then don't put them in the registry if you don't want them to know, right? So we don't feel like it's our job to disclose to people what somebody scored. I think it's their, their personal decision if they choose. So we're making it private. Um, you know, eventually, if the board and the members choose that they want to see it public, then we can talk about it. But right now, it's 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 zipped up tight, and, and no one will know except whoever has access to that 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 animal. Gotcha. Excellent. Um, any other? I guess any other um, things that we wanna we wanna talk about, or you wanna leave us with before we wrap up? Uh, you answered all my questions that I have. Yep. Um, no, I mean, I thought it was, I thought you did a great job. You've asked a lot of good questions. Um, no, I, I ask people to be patient and, you know, I'm, I'm behind the scenes. I mean, I don't, I don't get out and about quite, a, quite a lot. So I'm not on the forefront that much. I mean, even though I've been around for a while, but, but I will tell people to be patient as we get through this process, because we're all in it together and we really want what's best for them or we wouldn't spend this time and money on doing it. So we, we understand it's been painful, especially in a lot of states up north. We know it's been really painful now in Texas. Um, so we want to provide this service to help them manage their animals and make it more efficient. And I, I, I hope it works. I can tell you one thing that I've been working with Seabury for years. And, you know, I, I mean, I have people ask me questions all the time. Is it going to work? And I go, I, I never have worried about sleeping at night when Seabury is involved because I know he will make sure it's done right now. They may not get the answer they want, but I know that he'll do what's right. And next year it may be something else, right? It may be EHD, it may be something else that we work on, but he will do a good job, a thorough job to make sure that we get the data available to the breeders that they can make their decisions. Excellent. It's all exciting uh, for us, you know, as someone that's been staring at CWD for 20 years now almost. Uh, yeah. You know, it's this, this thorn that keeps just sticking everyone and, you know, when you see a technology like this where you're able to use um, really sound science and, and look at these evaluations and say, you know, there's a, there's a better way to do this and we have a way out now, uh, it's, it's a big deal. So I'm excited that we're, we're uh, nearing the absolute finish line almost. We're, we're almost there. From, from concept to commercial and, and it's just a, it's going to be a, a good thing. So we're. Well, I think the next step for you, Josh, is to, to meet with us again with me and David or me and Seabury, whatever, sure. um, and let us show you um, the actual report. And I think it's important, they, like, like we said, they see it over and over again. And we show the report. Here's what it looks like. Here's, here's how to interpret it. Here's what you need to do to make decisions. And I think that's going to be really helpful to your audience to, to see that, right? Because in the end, that's all they care about. Yeah, yeah. The and, and I've, I've said that, and of course I, I, I try to be as nuanced as I can because 
um, some people don't necessarily want to hear that, but like, you know, for the, for the deer breeder, they, their, their question is, what is my animal score and what do I do with that score? Right. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's I, that simple. I said, I use this? I'm paying this money, tell me what to do. Right. And, and it's not necessarily all that easy, but I think the more, and you stated it perfectly, the more we educate folks on these breeding values and how to interpret that data, the, the better everybody becomes at, at, at doing these types of evaluations and everybody benefits from that. So that's a big deal. Yeah, I, and I'm, I'm trying to be really careful because um, with, you know, Seabury, th this is his test and I know he's going to want to talk a lot about it. Um, and I'm not a scientist, but I kind of view it like a blood test for cholesterol, right? So I scored 205. Well, some doctors will say you need to take medicine. Others say just eat better. So it's going to be like that. It's going to be in a range and we have to decide, you know, do you, breed with this animal or not and some of us just the gut feeling based off this data and it's going to take experience to do that right yep. um and so again hopefully we'll have a report and data available that we can share with the breeder that can make them feel confident in making those decisions yeah perfect we'll, we'll end on that uh gary i really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us uh on the show today and we'll uh we'll catch up here in the near future as always uh stay tuned for another episode of north american deer talk